right, I think we'll get started. And grab your refreshments and have a seat. I'm Dr. Melissa Bailey Kuttner, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's Humanities Forum and Ancient Studies Week keynote lecture. Before I introduce Dr. Jennifer Trimble, I'm going to begin by inviting you to attend the next Humanities Forum event, coming up on Wednesday, October 23rd at 4 p.m. in this same location uh, for the annual Robert K. Webb Lecture. The title is Global History as Urban History, A View from Edo, the Greatest City in the World. And the talk is by Amy Stanley, Associate Professor of History at Northwestern University. And I'll just read you the blurb. Edo, now Tokyo, was once the greatest city in the world. In 1800, the era of Napoleon and revolution and declarations of independence, Edo boasted a population of 1.2 million. In comparison, London had a population of 1 million, Paris had 550,000, and New York was a tiny outpost of 60,000. Yet Edo is strangely invisible in global history. In part, this is because the city is difficult to integrate into the narratives of imperialism and trade that dominate global history scholarship. It was neither a colonial city nor a metropole. It was not a hub of foreign trade, and it was not even an ancient imperial capital. So what do we do with this strange, enormous, anomalous city? In this talk, Dr. Stanley explores the social history of early 19th century Edo in the context of global history, focusing on gender, violence, and consumption. She argues that global history does look different from the perspective of Japan, and that turning our attention to social history and the urban poor illuminates how and why mundane experiences of urban life were shared across many parts of the world in the 18th and 19th centuries. So I hope you all can make that event. I'm now delighted to introduce Dr. Jennifer Trimble, whom I have known for many years, especially as an unfailingly brilliant and generous advisor in graduate school. Jennifer Trimble is Associate Professor of Classics at Stanford University. Her work addresses Roman material culture and Roman visual culture from many, from many different perspectives. Her book, Women and Visual Replication in Roman Imperial Art and Culture, addresses repetition in Roman portrait statues, and especially how statues with different heads but identical bodies uh, construct um, social identity and public identity in Roman cities. She focuses, she focuses especially on how these statues are viewed and how they're meant to be seen in passing as part of the urban backdrop instead of isolated pieces in museums the way we usually see them now. Dr. Trimble has also worked on urbanism and mapping. She was co-director of the IRC Oxford Stanford Excavations in the Roman Forum, and she also co-directed Stanford's Digital Forma Urbis Romae project, a collaboration between computer scientists and archaeologists to help reassemble a fragmentary ancient map of the city of Rome. Most recently, Dr. Trimble has worked on material culture of Roman slavery. Her 2016 article, The Zeninus Collar and the Archaeology of Roman Slavery, analyzed inscribed iron collars from the uh, 4th and 5th century CE that were used to control enslaved people, probably especially to identify ones that had attempted to escape. Dr. Trimble addresses the history of these collars and how scholarship has mostly focused either on the inscriptions or the collars, but not on the collars as holistic artifacts in and of themselves. And she recontextualizes them both textually and archeologically. Her current book analyzes the visual culture of Roman slavery and how the visual played a crucial role in defining and enforcing slavery for both enslaved and free people. And now without further ado, Dr. Trimble will speak on the visual workings of Roman slave sales. Thank you so much. Uh, that was such a generous introduction. And I will start by saying that one of the most profound and wonderful aspects of this work we do is watching brilliant students become brilliant teachers and professors, and now my colleague, uh, Dr. Kuttner. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. I want to thank the Ancient Studies Department and the Drescher Center for the Humanities. It's such a pleasure to be here, to meet people and to share with you some of the material I've been working on. I hope there will be questions and comments at the end. I'd be really interested to know if any of this makes sense. You know, you sit at home and you work on things and you think, I, I don't even know anymore if it makes sense, but I think it does. So without further ado, come with me to Rome. 
Come with me to the imperial city of Rome in the first centuries of our era, not to the center of the city with its spectacular monuments like the Colosseum and the Column of Trajan, but to a tomb outside the city walls. Here's a map of Rome. There's the city center. There's the Colosseum. Come down here with me at the edge of the city where all the tombs were. In 1791, just outside the city walls on the Via Appia, a couple of tombs were excavated. I'm using the term excavated loosely. This was before scientific archaeology. They were dug up. No one at the time was doing archaeological recording properly or documented in any way we would think is right now. And we don't even know anymore where exactly this tomb is. But somebody drew a picture of the excavation. And they posed, in a sense, all the, whoops, sorry, they posed the inscriptions they found across the foreground. So we have a record. We're going to look very closely at this inscription here. It's an epitaph. For the classicists in the audience, I give you the original inscription, the Latin transcription, and then uh, the English, read whichever version you want. I'll read the English. To Aulus Memmius Clarus. Aulus Memmius Urbanus to his fellow freedman and his dearest companion. I do not remember, my most virtuous fellow freedman, that there was ever any quarrel between you and me. By this epitaph, I call on the gods above and the gods below as witnesses that I met you in the slave market that we were made free men in this, together in the same household, and that nothing ever separated us except the day of your death. These two men met when they were slaves up for sale. They then worked as slaves in the same household, and they were both eventually freed. We don't know how they came to be enslaved, how old they were, what kind of work they did, how Clarus died, or what the nature of this tremendous bond was. Were they friends? Were they lovers? Both are very possible, but the inscription does not say. Instead, it emphasizes their deep affection and their mutual esteem. During the centuries of Roman rule, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people like Clarus and Urbanus were sold in Roman slave markets but we know almost nothing about their lives. Our sources mostly express the perspective of slave buyers and slave masters. So this epitaph is a rare piece of evidence for the lives and priorities and emotions of people who were sold. And for that reason alone, it's very important. Slavery was a fundamental part of ancient Roman society. But enslaved people are also among the most invisible people within it. If we want to understand ancient Rome, we have to understand slavery. And that means trying to make enslaved people visible. This is the focus of the book I'm currently writing called Seeing Roman Slaves. And the specific contribution I think I can make to our understanding of Roman slavery is to show how profoundly visual it was. No one has really explored this aspect of Roman slavery. So in today's lecture, I want to give you an example of what I mean. I'm going to focus on one situation within slavery, the visual dynamics of Roman slave sales, of public slave sales. Now, not every enslaved person was sold. Many people were born into slavery and died there. But in public slave sales, we can really see the way the dynamics of seeing and looking, visibility and invisibility, shape slavery. Here's the argument I'm trying to make in this book and that I hope I can make today. What people in the Roman world saw was crucial to how they understood and how they experienced slavery. And this is true for free people and enslaved people alike. Today, I'll explore this in two main parts. Part one focuses on people. And in particular, a very interesting relationship that our sources construct 
between the visual deceptions of slave sellers and the visual inspections of slave buyers. Then in part two, I'll move on to things, looking at the uses of visual markers and written labels. And then I'll draw some conclusions. But I want to warn you from the start that this is difficult material. It is grim, it is disturbing, it is depressing, but it is also really important and revealing and very worth studying. Just a couple more preliminary notes. In some ways, Roman slavery is similar to any uh, slavery, slave system, including slavery as it was practiced in the United States in much more recent centuries. Both systems, like all slave systems, involve the treatment of some human beings as property to be exploited for their labor. <coughs> together with large-scale forms of violence and brutality that kept the institution in place. But Roman slavery is also different in a couple of key ways, for my purposes today, from more recent uh, historical slaveries. One way is that Roman slavery was not based on race, and it's important to remember that race as we understand it or see it at work in our world today or talk about it is a very modern construction from say the last three or so centuries. It did not exist in the ancient world. Exploitation happened on different grounds in the ancient world. The second difference is that, uh, is, is the importance in ancient Rome of being freed of manumission especially in the city of Rome itself and in central Italy, and especially for commercial and economic reasons, many enslaved people were eventually freed, as the two men in that epitaph were. <coughs> we don't know how many slaves were freed, but it's really clear that freed men and freed women formed an enormous and extremely important sector within Roman city life. So this is some of the backdrop. Let's begin with some of the people involved and how they are characterized in visual terms. A revealing place to look is visual depictions of slave sales. We have only two. This is one of them. It's a gravestone from Capua, about 125 miles south of Rome. Capua had a well-developed slave trade and very famously, of course, there's Capua, Rome and Capua. Very famously, this is the starting point for the most serious slave revolt in all of Roman history. I'm talking, of course, about Spartacus, an enslaved war captive who had uh, been captured in what's modern day Bulgaria by the Romans during their wars of conquest out there, brought back to Italy and sold to a gladiatorial troop. He led what turned out, what ended up being an enormous army, and it finally took eight Roman legions to bring him down. This gravestone dates to a generation later. In the lower register is depicted a slave sale. Let's look more closely. At the center, standing on a kind of pedestal, is a man who wears only a loincloth I don't know if you can see the outlines right there. This is the slave on sale. At left is the seller, gesturing toward the slave, his cloak flying up behind him with the force of his gesture. On the right is a man in a toga, also gesturing toward the slave, but in a much more restrained way, as befits his obviously higher status. He is the customer. <coughs> This depiction distills a slave sale down to three figures. But in fact, lots of other evidence makes it really clear that there were additional slaves and scribes and financial professionals, not to mention onlookers at a slave sale. So why do it this way? And what's especially interesting here is that Roman law and literary writings also tend to boil slave sales down to just these three key people take the law. I am quoting here the edict of the Ediles concerning slave sales. The Ediles were the Roman magistrates in charge of the markets, and their edict required certain things. Those who sell slaves 
are to apprise purchasers of any disease or defect in their wares. And whether a given slave is a runaway, a loiterer on errands, or still subject to noxal liability, that means punishment for some offense committed before, all these matters they must proclaim in due manner when the slaves are sold. In other words, the seller always had to tell the buyer if there were any problems with the person on sale. These, of course, were problems, quote unquote, from the perspective of the buyer, not the enslaved person. And these defects are defined in Roman law as essentially anything that prevented enslaved people from doing the work that masters wanted them to do. So here, as we see throughout Roman law and society, enslaved people are defined as both persons and as things. And this is expressed visually on that same gravestone from Capua. The seller and buyer occupy one kind of space, but the slave at center is depicted as occupying a different category. He's smaller, he stands on a podium, he's not dressed, his arms hang motionless at his sides. Roman law and literature generally constructed enslaved people, sellers, and buyers in three distinct ways. Slave sellers were assumed to cheat. They are universally described as greedy and unscrupulous, willing to do absolutely anything to make a profit. On the screen, I'm quoting just two descriptions of slave sellers, but I could give you many more examples like this. Paul the Jurist writes that, quote, this class of persons is more concerned with making profit, even disgracefully, torpiter. The second passage describes a slave seller in very similar terms. Quote, we are dealing with a man who doesn't blush, who stops at nothing. He is greedy even to the point of danger. And above all, these greedy slave sellers were said to manipulate the visual appearance and even the bodies of the people they were selling in order to deceive the buyer and get a higher price. So again, I'm quoting just two passages among many ancient passages that discuss exactly this. In the ancient sources, we read that people on sale had their hair cut and combed. They were made to wear nice clothes. Seneca writes about this. Slave dealers hide under some sort of finery any defect which may give offense. And the deceptions attributed to slave dealers were not just cosmetic, there were more physical modifications as well. Down below, we have Quintilian writing about slave dealers who, quote, feign color with rouge and real strength with useless fat. Here, he's talking about the practice of fattening people up to make them look healthier and stronger than they actually were. And for enslaved women and boys in particular, various ointments and preparations were used before the sale to lighten the skin and remove any freckles or other discolorations. And here we should remember that in Roman culture, white skin was always associated with women and effeminacy. When Romans talk about skin color, they're talking about gender. So here's an example of that in a mythological wall painting from Pompeii. It's the myth of Pasiphae and Daedalus, and Pasiphae as, as a woman has pale skin, and Daedalus as a proper man has reddish brown skin. This painting has nothing to do with slave sales. I'm simply showing you this very typical gender coding of skin color. But this mattered for slave sales because boys and young men were often sold for their sexual attractiveness. And here, the slave dealers' deceptions get quite gruesome. The dealers, we read, used various concoctions to hide the signs of puberty, or to delay the onset of puberty, or to prevent puberty altogether by castrating the boy. In all these references, the visual is treated as very powerful. These visual deceptions create an effect of truth, and people then respond to what they think they see. 
So the visual is powerful, but it's also slippery and dangerous because it allows for these deceptions and lies. You can't believe what you see, and yet you have to go by what you see. This raises a different question. Were all these negative statements about the terrible things that slave dealers did actually true? There's no way of knowing. But it is striking that the authors of these texts I'm quoting were all members of the Roman elite. They would never have stooped so low as to sell people or sell anything else for a living. They were basically aristocrats. Roman magistrates and jurists came from that same elite. And so maybe it's no surprise that Roman law did the same thing. It treated the slave buyers as upright citizens and as normative Romans. Now let me be clear, I am in no way suggesting that we should be sympathetic to slave dealers. What I am saying is that Roman society took all the problematic aspects of slave sales, any discomfort or contradictions or negative assessments, and displaced them entirely onto the sellers, who were essentially scapegoated in all this, while slave buyers were never criticized. So how did slave sellers respond to this overwhelming opinion that they were terrible people, that they were greedy, that they were unscrupulous, that they were visually deceitful? On this same gravestone from Capua, we are actually seeing how a slave dealer represented himself. There are two inscriptions on the gravestone, one up here and one right there. And the top one tells us that Marcus Publilius Sater, who had been a slave himself and then freed, set up this gravestone for himself and for Marcus Publilius Stephanus, who had been his slave and whom he had freed. The freed slave, Sater, was a slave owner in turn, and this turns out to be very common in the evidence. An interesting point in this image is how similar the men look. In that upper register, they both wear the toga of a free Roman man. And they mirror each other's poses and gestures, which visually emphasizes the close relationship between them, even as the inscription marks a very, very sharp hierarchy. The only real difference between them is that the man on the right is older, do you see how he is balding? He, we think that must be Sater. And the man on the left has no signs of age and a full head of hair. And we think this is, he looks younger. So we think that must be Stephanos. The second inscription states that this gravestone was put up by two more ex-slaves, Cadia and Timotes. Cadia was a praiko, an auctioneer, and his job put together with the visual image of the slave sale, indicate that these men work together in a slave dealing business. So this is a very complex situation. All four of these men had been slaves. And at least one of them was a slave owner himself. All four of them seem to have made a living by selling other people. But what I want to focus on here is the way that this gravestone responds to all that invective, all those stereotypes about deceptive slave sellers. Look at that lower register again. Notice the way that the enslaved person is depicted wearing only a loincloth. From the slave dealer's perspective, this image seems to be claiming to show the truth of this slave's body. Nothing is being concealed here. And notice something else. In this image, both the seller and the buyer on either side are depicted at looking at the same body in the middle. In other words, the visual message is that there's no deception here. There's no slave that the seller then manipulates, creating a fraudulent version that the buyer then looks at. In this case, seller and buyer are looking at and seeing exactly the same body. I think this is a self-justifying message by the slave dealer. So what about the buyers? Our ancient texts express anxiety on the part of slave buyers about how visual appearances can deceive. 
In response to the deceptions of slave sellers, the buyers were said to carry out very careful visual inspections of the people on sale. These inspections are described as invasive, sometimes sexualized, always degrading to the person so inspected. So this is yet another way in which looking and seeing defined and enforced what slavery meant to everyone involved in different ways, depending on their legal status. These inspections often entailed stripping the person so that the buyer could see more and better, and they could involve physical examinations and also verbal questions. So, for example, in this first quote, the poet Marshall is talking about a man wandering around a luxury market that included slaves for sale. And this man, quote, inspected tender boys, devouring them with his eyes. The second passage on the screen is a bit different. This comes from Suetonius' biography of the first emperor, Augustus. And what we're hearing about here are the criticisms that were leveled against that emperor, Augustus. His great enemy, Mark Antony, accused Augustus of adultery and debauchery. And this is an example of that. His friends acted as his panders and stripped and inspected matrons and well-grown girls as if Toranios the slave dealer were putting them up for sale. So the problem for Mark Antony and other elite Romans was not that slaves on sale were stripped and stared at in this degrading way. The problem was that respectable free women were being treated like slaves on sale. So another thing we see here is the way that in Roman thought, different social categories, respectable free women, <coughs> slaves on sale, are defined as in relation to one another. The status, the proper respect due to elite women is here defined as the opposite of what happens to people being sold. With this in mind, let's look again at that line in Seneca about how slave sellers conceal defects under fine clothing. Here's that same line, but now in some context. Seneca was a Roman politician and a Stoic philosopher. And in this letter to his friend Lucilius, Seneca is making a bigger point about how surface appearances can conceal the truth. And he is using, apparently, a widely known aspect of Roman slave sales to make that point. When you buy a horse, you order its blanket to be removed. You pull off the garments from slaves that are advertised for sale so that no bodily flaws may escape your notice. If you judge a man, do you judge him when he's wrapped in a disguise? Slave dealers hide under some sort of finery any defect which may give offense. And for that reason, the very trappings arouse the suspicion of the buyer. If you catch sight of a leg or an arm that's bound up in cloths, you demand that it be stripped and that the body itself be revealed to you. Several things about this passage are striking. Notice that the reader is addressed as you. You, Seneca's reader, are put in the position of the slave buyer and the slave owner. The other possible positions here, slave seller or slave, would be unthinkable for men of this elite social level. And indeed, enslaved people here are assimilated to animals, stripped for inspection like a horse. Another thing, in these inspections, as Seneca describes them at least, two things are happening simultaneously. The inspection is terribly degrading for the enslaved person, at the same time as it characterizes the slave buyer as a man of good judgment and competence. Whatever the slave seller has done in order to produce a certain visual appearance must be detected through careful inspection by the buyer who aims to see through those deceptions. It's crucial that the body itself, ipsum corpus, the truth of the matter, be made visible to the eye of the buyer. And another thing. In all of these passages, the body of the enslaved person is looked at and manipulated in parts. We see that in the last line of this passage. Seneca refers to a leg or an arm, not a full body or a full person. 
We saw that same fragmentation of the slave body in the law, which talked about specific defects. And we saw it also in the texts about slave dealers' deceptions, which are all about enhancing or modifying certain parts of the body. In all of these writings, the body of the enslaved person was treated piecemeal, a collection of parts to be hidden, dressed up, undressed, inspected. These visual dynamics I've been talking about, both the seller's deceptions and the buyer's inspections, are always expressed on the bodies of the enslaved. And the, those bodies are the object of competing gazes. One gaze is that of the seller, who dresses enslaved people up, fattens them up, applies makeup and clothing to conceal flaws and to create a visual impression of strength or sexual attractiveness. That gaze, the seller's gaze, is deceitful, clever, profit-oriented. The other gaze is that of the buyer, who aims to see through these visual deceptions, who undresses the person on sale, touches, prods, pokes the different parts of the body. That gaze is suspicious, analytical, judgmental, invasive. But both forms of looking, as different as they are, turn into intensely physical and inv invasive experiences for the enslaved person. And so once again, looking is a tangible way in which slavery is defined and experienced. In part one, I was talking about people. In part two, I move now to things, to the ways in which visual signs and written labels were used during slave sales. Roman life was full of visual signs. The Roman toga is a classic case. The plain toga, off-white in color, no stripes or exciting things, was the simple marker of a free male citizen. Slaves were forbidden to wear the toga. And if a woman wore the toga, she was signaling that she was a prostitute. There are special forms of toga. If it was whitened with chalk, or in Latin, candida, this marked a man who was standing for election, and this is where we get our word, candidate. Magistrates' togas had purple stripes, and so on. Or take the famous priestesses of Rome, the six Vestal Virgins. Most women typically wore colorful clothing. Most men wore dark cloaks. The Vestals wore white robes with special headdresses. I'll give you just one more example of visual signs in Roman culture before we return to slave sales. The fasces. This was the bundle of rods that symbolized the power of a magistrate. And magistrates were always accompanied by attendants whose sole job was apparently to carry around these fasces. And this, of course, is where we get the modern term fascism, thanks to Mussolini's use of ancient Roman emblems of authority in Italy in the 1920s and 30s. In short, the ancient Romans marked and defined identity through visual signs. And everyone who lived in Roman society grew up seeing and recognizing those markers. Think of this as a highly visually literate society. And in particular, what people wore on their bodies or had with them, the shapes, the materials, the colors, the emblems, told other people who they were and how to treat them. This backdrop helps us understand the various visual markers used during Roman slave sales. Each one of these meant something different, but all of them marked the person as available for inspection and purchase. The garland on the head indicated a war captive to be sold. This was an archaic practice. In the period I'm mostly talking about, it probably wasn't used anymore. <coughs> Chains were a very different kind of sign. Enslaved people were not normally chained. Chaining was used as a temporary punishment, especially on for farms and probably also in quarries and in mines, which are some of the hardest and the worst situations to be a Roman slave in. But if a slave had ever been chained, 
even if only briefly, this had permanent consequences. Forever after, that person was officially termed a servus vincus, a chained slave. And this status had to be declared in a Roman slave, slave sale. And it lowered the price of the, slave, the sale. Another kind of sign used during slave sales are white feet. Pliny the Elder explains this. In this section, he's discussing different varieties of white chalk and their uses. And he writes, the most inferior kind is the one which our ancestors made it the practice to use for tracing the line indicating victory in circus races and for marking the feet of slaves on sale that had been imported from overseas. So white and feet always meant that this was not somebody who'd been born in Rome or Italy, but who came from far away. And if you start looking at what far away meant, we're still within the Roman Empire. This normally meant uh, modern day Turkey and uh, out on the Syrian border, but also other people, right? It just meant from a distant province. So these whitened feet add to that fragmentation of the body on sale that I was talking about before, that piecemeal presentation. And I've mentioned the uses of the color white, which always seems to be a marked category. It can be positive or it can be negative. So it can be positive as in the specially whitened toga of a candidate for office or the Vestal Virgin's white robes. But it can more often mean uh, something very negative uh, in Roman thinking. So I've mentioned that white skin was associated with women and with effeminate males. Roman writers saw this as a terrible departure from the norm, which was all about free masculinity. Women wore, who wore white makeup on their skin uh, were mocked and criticized. Male actors playing female roles had whitened hands, but actors are generally vilified in Roman society. And so I think in the same way, the whitened feet of slaves on sale marks them as departures from that Roman norm people from far away, people who are quite at the opposite end of the social scale. And notice Pliny's word choice here. It's kind of gratuitous. He calls this kind of chalk the willissima. This is translated here as the most inferior kind, but it means something close to our most vile or most base. This is a moral judgment. Another visual marker is sometimes used, and this is the fourth one on my list, was a cap that was put on the head of the person on sale. Our evidence comes from Aulus Gellius, and his explanation reveals something really interesting. Gallius Sabinus, the jurist, has written that it was usual whoops, when selling slaves to put caps on those for whom the seller assumed no responsibility. He says the reason for that custom was that the law required that slaves of that kind be marked when offered for sale in order that buyers might not err and be deceived, that it might not be necessary to wait for the bill of sale, but might be obvious at once what kind of slaves they were. Notice here again the focus on protecting the slave buyers from being cheated. We've seen this sympathy for the slave buyer before. But there's something new at the end of the passage. The reason these caps were used was so that, quote, it might be obvious at once what kind of slaves they were, end quote. The implication is that a visual marker, something that could be seen right away, was important for its immediate and powerful impact. It could be more powerful than the actual written bill of sale. Powerful enough to lead the buyer to make a bad purchase. The cap solves that problem because it uses visual power to convey the necessary meaning instantly. Everything the buyer then sees is framed by the cap on the head of the person on sale. Let's talk more about the use of writing in Roman slave sales. Enslaved people on sale were accompanied by written labels called tituli. The Roman poet Propertius mentions this in a passage of a love poem. He talks about one of those on whose barbarian neck a placard hung and whose chalk feet shuffled in the middle of the forum. 
Propertius, by the way, is here insulting a potential rival in love. This is a man who has been freed and who's become wealthy and who can therefore buy presents for the poet's girlfriend and lure her away. So to insult his rival, the poet here recalls his time on sale. But he look, notice that he's using vivid visual imagery, the white feet, the placard hanging on the neck, in order to bring his rival's past degradation as a slave into the present. We don't have any surviving tituli. But these clearly offered very limited and very specific information tailored to the interests of a slave buyer in extracting labor. The titulus probably listed what work a person could do. It surely didn't describe family relationships or the enslaved person's own hopes or desires. Just like the slave seller's visual deceptions, just like the buyer's visual inspections, these written labels profoundly redefined the enslaved persons. They permanently affected how he or she was looked at and treated. This brings me to the last form of visual marker or written text that I want to talk about here, the bill of sale. Let me explain what these were. Bills of sale were legal documents. And like all important legal documents in the Roman world, they were usually written on wax tablets, at least in the western half of the empire, and then on papyrus in the Greek Eastern Empire. I'm going to focus on wax tablets. And I'm showing you a reconstruction to give you an idea. These are rectangular slices of wood. Either two or three of these wooden slices were tied together to make a kind of booklet. The inside surfaces, as you see here, were recessed and filled with melted wax. A blackened wax was generally used, and once it cooled and hardened, it made a useful writing service, surface, as you see in another reconstruction here. Now, because we're talking about organic material, wax tablets generally don't survive. But we do have a few bits and pieces. Here is part of a bill of slave sale found in London. Only a little bit of the wax survives. It's this grayish triangle. But luckily for modern scholars, the stylus went all the way through the wax and scratched the wood below. You're looking at an enhanced image of those scratches. Within this text, we find out that this was a girl or woman named Fortunata, that she came from somewhere in modern day France, that the seller guaranteed certain things, just like the edict of the ediles required, and that she was sold for 600 denarii. There were intensely visual aspects to how these documents worked and how they gained legal force. To explain this, I need to take you to Romania, more specifically the Roman province of Dacia. And there, in the 19th century, hidden away in the shaft of a Roman gold mine, were discovered about two dozen Roman wax tablets, documents of various legal transactions. Three of those documents record the sale of slaves. Here's how these wax tablets worked. They are triptychs, meaning three wooden leaves are tied together. The front and back so the f these remain, uh, th they were the outside covers and they were used for protection. They generally weren't written on. Inside, the legal text was written twice. The first copy was written on side two and continued on to side three. That was the copy that would be closed up and sealed. The second copy, written on side four and five, always remained open thereafter for consultation. Once both these copies of the text had been written, they were inspected by witnesses. And then the first and second leaves of the tablet were tied together with string, closing up that inner text. The witnesses then signed their names on the right side of side four. Melted wax was dripped over the binding cord where it passed over the page. 
and the witnesses impressed their seals into that melted wax. No one could now change the internal text without breaking these seals. Any evidence of tampering would be immediately visible. In other words, the legal effectiveness of any kind of wax tablet depended on a very specific combination of visibility and invisibility, of the presence of a text that could never be seen. And I'm just showing you here a detail of a wall painting from Pompeii, which shows a wax tablet that has that recorded a deed or a loan or something, some important legal transaction. Here it is, fully executed and sealed. And just by virtue of its appearance, it had powerful visual authority. So here's an example of one of those slave bills of sale found in the gold mine back in Dacia. My apologies for the fuzzy image. I was not able to find a better image, but I think it's worth looking at. This one records the sale of a six-year-old girl named Pasia. And in the photos, you see sides two and three, which had the inner text, and those are drawings of those pages right there. And then at the bottom, you see page four, which had the seals and the names of the witnesses. Here's the first part of that inner text. We find out the name of the buyer, Maximus, son of Beto, and the name of the seller, Dacius, son of Verzo. Maximus has bought a girl by the name of Passia, around six years of age, for 205 denarii. And very roughly, this is the equivalent of something like $16,000 or $18,000 today. The deed continues on to side three. At the end, we learn the date. This sale was executed on March 17th, 139 CE. And on side four are the names of six witnesses plus the seller here at the bottom. This is a drawing, it's much more decipherable. These weren't signatures, the scribe wrote all these names. But next to that name, each, every man pressed his personal seal into the melted wax that covered the cord that tied together the inner text. What we are seeing here is the visual enactment of the law. The witnesses' seals physically guaranteed that the inner text was intact. At the same time, those seals and the names added those men's social identity, their physical presence at the sale, their personal guarantee that the sale and the tablet were properly done. Now these legal witnesses are always men. Women in Roman society generally could not act on their own behalf in transactions like this. And we don't know how these men were chosen, but they were obviously present in the marketplace or the military camp or wherever this deed was done. These numerous witnesses make this in some sense a public transaction done in the public eye. And their visual performance in that moment then meant that the tablet's legal integrity remained visible far into the future. Bills of sale then went with the new slave owner. They were carefully kept in personal archives which is where we sometimes find them, archaeologically. They were even hidden away at times of danger. They were only invalidated if something new happened. The slave died, or was sold again with a new bill of sale. Or maybe the person was freed, which was also recorded on a wax tablet, but this time it went with the freed person. We don't know what happened to six-year-old Passia. But we do know that these visual processes and the visual involvement of all these people formalized her position as chattel, as property. Let me try to pull all this together. What does all this tell us? I want to offer three conclusions. First, I hope I've demonstrated that visual dynamics permeated Roman slave sales from slave dealers' visual deceptions to slave buyers' visual inspections, from the visual markers used during slave sales to the visual rituals that guaranteed the bill of sale. 
When we study Roman slave sales like this from a visual perspective, we can really see how visual culture helped explain and define and reinforce slavery. The second conclusion. Looking closely at this evidence can show us entirely different experiences of the very same situation. Seneca can casually refer to the stripping of slaves during sale to make a philosophical point about not being deceived by appearances. A slave dealer can make sure his gravestone responds in a very different way to stereotypes about cheating dealers. The enslaved people themselves went through a terrible experience and found ways to try to survive. The goal here is not to unify all these differences. The point is not to write a single history of Roman slavery or ancient Rome or anywhere. What we are seeing, what we're looking closely at in this material are the differences, the clashing perspectives, the incompatible experiences that made up lived reality. And my third point here, these visual aspects of slave sales resonated in the Roman imaginary. Love poets like Propertius imagined their rivals in love as wealthy ex-slaves, and they drew on visual images like whitened feet to evoke that. Other mentions of slave sales in the public eye do other kinds of work. This imagery, the visuality of Roman slave sales was powerful in Roman thought. It did certain kinds of work far beyond the slave market. Fine, that's all very well. But why plunge into such grim material and why drag you all through it with me? This is a big question, right? Why not focus on the wonders of Roman architecture instead or something a lot more pleasant than the details of Roman slave sales? I don't have an easy answer for that. And the most, the most difficult part of working on this book has been to dwell at length, up close and personal, with the horrors of Roman slavery. But this raises an even bigger question. How do we engage with other societies, other people, other institutions, even when, or perhaps especially when, they seem so alien, so deeply wrong? Where's the line? between maintaining a distance from terrible things, but on the other hand, really understanding this time and place. I think it really matters to try to do this kind of work for several reasons. First off, if we are historians or archeologists, if we are serious students of the past, we have to try to understand it fully as best we can. We have to not be selective and only look at the fun and uplifting material. And that means studying slave sales as well as wonderful philosophy or, or poetry. And if we do that, we understand the Romans better. We understand, in this case, how social hierarchies were defined and expressed in visual terms. And we also understand better the experiences of the people who went through Roman slavery. I also think that looking at visual aspects of Roman slavery or diving into the Roman past can offer a rich case study, a different perspective, a deeper understanding on the way that massive inequality can be entrenched in our own society. Roman slavery was a structural feature built into fa every facet of life. And this gives us a vivid example to think with for our own world and the way profound inequality can be defined and reinforced and made ordinary every day in a million different ways. We could think here about income inequality in the United States or in the world, in the difference between the first and the third worlds. Or we could think about the difficulty of changing this world's reliance on fossil fuels, even as we can see the dangers of, of climate change. It's important to remember how deeply entrenched and embedded these structural features are that helps us then decide what we want to do about it and maybe act more effectively. And finally, let's remember the people. I want to end where I began with Aulus Memmius Urbanus and Aulus Memmius Clarus. These two men at least 
don't have to be invisible to us. In their epitaph, we get glimpses of what they went through in the slave market and as Roman slaves. But notice how Urbanus also inverts that dominant structure that I've been talking about, inverts those values. In this epitaph, he presents a whole different set of values. We know that people being sold in the slave market were looked at by potential buyers as property to be used as things. But this inscription shows Urbanus looking at Claros as a person, always, regardless of his changing legal status. We've seen that elite writers describe slave sales as permanently degrading for the enslaved. But here, the emphasis is on dignity and esteem. We know that in the slave market, people for sale were described by written labels called tituli. But here, Urbanus uses that same word, titulus, to describe this epitaph. Hoc quoque titulu. In the slave market, we've seen how witnesses were called on to sign and seal the bill of sale. Here, Urbanus invokes witnesses. He invokes the gods as witnesses to the life and the deep love that he shared with Clarus. I don't want to romanticize things. We're not seeing a broad anti-slavery movement here. This is one guy. And as powerful as his statement is, it was hidden away inside a tomb far out of the public eye. But what we are seeing here is what one enslaved and later freed person did. He had this much wiggle room within this very brutal structure and he took it and he did this with it. Urbano suffered through slavery, his life unfolded at the whim of other people. But let's also remember this, let's honor what he was able to do. Thank you so much for your attention and for being here. I would love to take questions. Oh, I should talk into the microphone. <laughs> Comments, questions, random thoughts. Yes, please. Did enslaved people like also contribute to like mainstream visual culture, like public monuments or like what we call it art? Yes, in all kinds of ways. The records, as always in studying this stuff, the evidence is fragmentary and difficult and, and a nightmare to work with. But um, plenty of artists and craftsmen were slaves and ex-slaves. So already they're the makers of art in a lot of uh, situations. There are depictions of enslaved people. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. Thank you for recalling that. Yes? How would a slave, um, a Roman slave, gone about achieving freedom, becoming a freed man? Just purchasing it or like it being granted by the master? There are various ways, and they almost never explain <laughs> how they did it, right? Um, there are a couple of uh, legal things that happened in Roman slavery that facilitated uh, getting to manumission for some people. So, um, for instance, uh, and this happens mainly in cities and in commercial contexts, um, enslaved people uh, were not allowed to own their own property, everything belonged to the master, but uh, they were given a thing called a peculium sometimes, which is uh, money or assets or animals or sometimes other slaves to manage and to try to make money off of. So that would be one way they could earn their own money and then maybe buy their own freedom. Um, there's a lot of evidence that in these commercial settings for various reasons, it was beneficial to the master to have the enslaved person go out and work and earn money and also then uh, it was beneficial for slave masters to free slaves because freedmen had more commercial power and still owed, legally owed, respect and duties to the master. So that, this, was a, this was a good situation. So especially for men, we see some uh, pretty uh, well-trodden avenues toward manumission. For women, it's a whole different um, ballgame because uh, they are much less caught up in craft production and in commercial work, and so there are fewer opportunities. Um, there's also this whole thing where um, any enslaved person is considered to have no control over their own body, so they are 
available for the sexual use of, of their master or whoever. So this then affects women, and Roman society then looks at enslaved women saying, ah, you are clearly a you know, degraded, promiscuous person because everybody has access to you. So then when the, the woman gets freed, she's suddenly supposed to take on the virtues of the respectable and chaste Roman matrona, right? The respectable Roman woman. And this is, this is a very, very slippery uh, ideological situation. There's a great book by uh, Matthew Perry on, on exactly that transition. And he points out this is probably one reason why um, so many of the freed women that we read about are freed by their masters and then get married to their masters. So this person is then their ex-owner and their husband, which is very mind-bending, right? And then, you know, they negotiate that in whatever way they can negotiate that. This takes us very far from your original question, which I uh, confess I've forgotten. But did I answer any of you actually asked? Okay. Has my mission. <laughs> I have to be honest about these things. Now, now I've shut everybody up. Um, over there and then over there. Please. So what factors influence how much a slave was worth? So besides obvious things like maybe health and age and things like that, was there any type of labor that was favored? Or was younger versus young adult? Um, um, newly enslaved were considered more valuable than the quote unquote veterans. Um, let's see, heavy, unskilled labor uh, is treated as less financially valuable. One of the, you get such weird stuff. There's, okay, so we have this weird text called The Life of Aesop. Remember Aesop, the figure who goes around having all these sort of adventures? Anyway, there's a, there's a biography, it's anonymous, it was added to over time, but he starts out as a slave. He starts out as a field worker, and he is sold in a slave market, but he's so clever that he parlays his situation up into, you know, he's always getting the best of everybody else. And what you see from reading The Life of Aesop and from reading um, other sources is that um, skills were more valuable and it was also an easier life for the enslaved person. So then there were these very strong interests in trying to, in my context of the slave market, and trying to be sold as a skilled person, not as a brute laborer. And then, you know, super valuable people. There's an awesome story about Mark Antony. Um, he, uh, apparently, from the same slave dealer, Toranios, who was mentioned earlier, uh, Mark Antony bought uh, two kids, two young boys, um, and he bought them as twins. And this was, you know, and he paid some crazy amount of money, which I'm in the moment forgetting, but uh, because they were really handsome and they looked exactly like. And then he got them home and started talking to them. Turns out they come from totally different parts of the empire. You know, they speak different languages. They're not. And so he goes back to Toranius. And you would think, right, here is Toranius, you know, discovered in just a prime deception. He is so busted. Um, and what Toranius says was, well, actually, they're even more valuable because what are the chances of finding two guys from two different places who look identical and can be passed as twins? And Toranius flatters Mark Antony so much that Mark Antony leaves and he's happier than he was before. <laughs> so the whole thing is a character assassination of Mark Antony, right? <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, so there are all different kinds of levels. One thing we have to remember is that Roman slavery is, is has a vast range of experiences and possibilities and, and uh, life events with them. Let's see, somebody over here ages ago had his hand up. Yes? Um, this is not really a question, more so looking for what you think about this. And I apologize if this is kind of a aimless, but one thing that I've always kind of noticed is that uh, like stoicism um, that has been very impactful to all of our history and it permeates to a lot of stuff that we like, hold value to today. It's just interesting that uh, the, like, the three big Stoics, the, the like, Marcus Aurelius and um, Epictetus and Seneca, um, they all had a very close relationship like, with slavery. With like, Epictetus having, um, I don't even know if I'm saying his name right, but with him being a slave and being owned by a free slave. And um, yeah, it's, they teach very like profound and insightful things, and then they don't ever really preach out against slavery. Mm -hmm. you, you put your finger on a sort of raging debate over on that side of the classics and discipline, right? Because, you know, Seneca in some places makes very powerful arguments for treating your slaves humanely, he says. 
is what people should do. Um, but then, you know, so some people have said, oh, he's actually a nice guy when it comes to slavery. Look, he's, he's sort of seeing kind of the humanity and, and the, the inhumanity of the institution and the humanity of the people trapped in it. Um, and then other people have come back and said, no, he's just trying to soften the brute edges so that, you know, enslaved people will not rebel. Um, and of course, he was a major slave owner himself, but all of these elite guys were, all of them. Slave owning went so deep in Roman society. I mean, you know, most people own slaves, right? So Stoics are no different from other people in that. But you're also touching on one of my big themes today, which is what do we do with somebody like Seneca? He says some really profound and beautiful and insightful things about how to live a good life. And then he turns around and says, ah, just like you strip a slave with slave sales, right? So, so how do we, I mean, it, Partly, you, you've touched on the crux that I, I grapple with this, in materi with this material and that I grapple with as a Romanist. Right? So, thank you. Thank you for the comment. Why do you think it's so common that former slaves turn around and become slave owners? You would think that like, personal experience would make it a little bit more distasteful. You would think, you would think. It's one of the profoundly, there's so many profoundly shocking things once you look, and that's one of them. And it's ordinary, that's the default situation. And the only thing I can think is that um, Roman slavery is so entrenched. There's no, there are all these different ways in which um, this structure is imposed and kept in, in place and also, uh, in which people's only options for a better life are to try to crawl out on their own, right? There's, there's no incentive to bond with other slaves. There's no incentive to have fellow feeling and to have a, a slave revolution. You know, Roman society doesn't set up that way. And so um, one of the reasons, I think, is that um, as a brutal repressive institution, Roman slavery is very successful in keeping that brutality and repression in place. And one of the ways it does it is by uh, particularizing, is by individualizing. Say, uh, you know, in, in teaching people in a zillion different ways, improving to people in a zillion different ways, your life may be miserable, but you can make it this much better, and this is the only route that you can do that. And so that's one thing. Another thing is that um, whenever we talk about Freedmen in the big cities, what we're talking about is the top end of Roman slavery. These guys had the best kind, still horrific and very, very difficult and terrible situations, but so much better than people laboring their lives on farms and never having, I mean, people on farms are basically never manumitted or much, much more rarely, you know, people could be condemned to the mines and there was just a question of being worked to death, right? Here, there's a very different thing. And I think there, here again, we're back to the bigger structure, which is how does Roman slavery stay in place? It, in, in many, many different ways. And one of the ways is by um, offering these little escape hatches up at the top. You know, I sometimes think about Roman slavery as this great vertical funnel, right, of, of these different um, experiences or possibilities. And all the way at the top, you know, there's some, there's some leeway, there's some mobility up at the top. So these guys are rewarded um, up, up there at the top. So it's, it's, it ties back into structure. And then other than that, I have no idea. I don't know. It's, it's very strange. It's very strange. It's sobering, right? Because you know you come from a lot of perspective, and you, th and you think this, it is self-evident that this is a bad thing. And then you spend a lot of time in this society where it's just not self-evident that it's a bad thing. What the heck do we do with that? <coughs> Thank you for the comment. Oh, please. So I've recently been reading Dio Chrysostom, a second sophistic raider's uh, seven speech in which he argues against prostitution based in part on a sort of basic idea of human rights, uh, namely that we're all made by one God. Uh, is this idea in isolation or does this position uh, and other possible life positions uh, change the de facto state of Roman slaves in a later empire? You are touching on another huge, juicy issue, and that is what happens with early Christianity. Um, I'm going to skirt the issue of Diocrisis Stone because I'd have to go back and look at that passage and try to give you a, a reasoned 
uh, response, but I, I'll broaden out and say this becomes a live issue, right? Because you get various, uh, you know, certainly you had modern scholars looking back and saying, hang on, you know, we have a new religion or individual philosophers who say, look, we're all people, doesn't that mean that we shouldn't have an institution like slavery? And it turns out, no, nobody's getting rid of slavery, even as they talk about we're all humans. Um, yeah, that's another huge one. That's not my period. Once we get into the late antique, um, that's not my period. So you can just say I'm just weaseling out of your very tough question here. You know, just, but I, but I don't. Yeah, I don't have an answer for you. And part of that is because I don't know that period well enough. I tend to hang out in the first, in the imperial period and earlier, and there's some really big changes uh, later on. I don't know. I'm surrounded by classicists here. Does anybody have a better answer than I do? Yeah. Kyle Harper is a scholar that wrote a book about slavery in late antiquity. Be a good source. Okay. His conclusion is that it didn't get any better. Though. <laughs> 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 I have a question. Oh, I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> Just a quick quote. I think it was the Perpetius example where he was invoking somebody's past who was his um, competitor. And I, I thought it was interesting because I think, I feel like I run across the assumption a lot in Roman um, history that sort of once a free person was free, they were sort of visually indistinguishable mm -hmm. from other Roman citizens. Um, but this seems to show Propertius sort of using memory to try mm -hmm. and erase and counteract that. So I was wondering if you could run across other examples where people are using memory or visual things that they think they can identify to sort of undermine the status of people. Mm -hmm. uh, the part that I've done the work on is the whitened feet, and uh, we have a line in Propertius and a line in Tobolus and a line in Ovid, and they all do roughly the same thing. Um, the Tobolus one is, is great. His girlfriend has gone off with some guy into the country, and Tobolus feels very badly about this. And it turns out we find out who the guy is, and he turns out to be a guy who had whitened feet, one being sold in the slave platform, and who's now, who's been freed, and who's now fantastically wealthy, and, and you know, is stealing Tobolus's sweetheart. Um, and so, so they keep doing this. It becomes, it, it's just one. They don't do it all the time. There's, you know, I've, I've only found three references in, the, in, the, in Latin elegy. Um, but it is always used as contrast. It is always used as this way of sort of bringing up the past. That Pliny passage about the vilissima form of white chalk used on the, you know, the white feet of, of uh, slaves brought from far away, Okay, so he's been marching through the natural history, that part of the natural history. He's just telling you about chalk, and here's how we use it, and it's got some medical uses, and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly, in that passage, he just goes off. He goes nuts. He's just like, ah, oh, let me tell you about these freedmen. <laughs> he goes on a rant about these guys who came to Rome with whitened feet and who now become, you know, super powerful, and they all, you know, they acted as the henchmen of powerful politicians, and they profited from the bloodshed of the prescriptions, you know, and, and he goes on and on, and, 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 you know, the whole thing is just this beautiful rhetorical set piece, and, and at the end, uh, oh, what's the line? It's something about that the whitened feet are put up against the laureled fasces. So remember the fasces, the rod of authority that I was telling you about, right? This is legitimate magistrates, and if they have laurels bound around them, that's a good visual marker. But, you know, these whitened feet, those people shouldn't have power. This juxtaposition is just, you know, a sign of Roman society falling apart. It's kind of a, a, a stereotype that Roman society is falling apart. Um, but that's how I see it used. I see it used as a, a kind of trope of, yeah, of bringing the past into the present. I mean, here, uh, this is um, a long passage in which the, uh, the old drunken friend of the girlfriend, the, the Lena, sort of a witchy, you know, twisted old woman is saying to the propitious girlfriend, um, don't hang out with that poet. <laughs> What's he going to give you except verses? Go for the guys who have the gold, right? Go for the guys who can give you wealthy things. And she lists, you know, a soldier and a sailor, and, and, and uh, she ends with this guy, right? So um, there's a way that uh, these things are brought up as a, yeah, as that kind of balance, as both things happening at the same time, the power and the present, 
with the degradation in the past. Mm. Cats and dogs live together. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have, to, oh, Molly and then. Okay. Um, a quick one because there's so few of them. Uh, bills of sale, do all of the inner texts match the outer texts? Are, are there scribal errors or um, even more interesting skullduggery? No skullduggery survived that I know of. I haven't okay. read them all. I mean, I've sort of been looking at these and focusing on the bills of sale, but I haven't heard anybody mention skullduggery. Um, there are some errors, that, you know, people get the dates wrong. And then you wonder, these witnesses who, who didn't even sign their own names, how literate were they? I don't think they're doing an inspection of the words. I think they're hearing the texts read. The scribe is reading the inner text and then the outer text, and the witness is saying, yeah, that sounds like the same text, and then signing, right? So, so you get tiny little errors, but mostly where the evidence survives, and very little of it survives, because this is organic stuff and it's all deteriorated. It, it, it does seem to be the same. You had a question? I don't think Romans were that um, alienated, or the idea of slaves becoming powerful was that foreign to them, because it wasn't one of the, like, one of the seven kings of Rome, the uh, former slave. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah. Good thing to bring in. Absolutely. This is built into their own way of thinking about themselves but they tend to object to it. It's there, they're familiar with it. And of course it's the elikas, right? It's the guys who come from the long lineages and the noble families, they're the ones who object the most strenuously. Presumably the freedmen are not objecting, right? They're like, ha, ah, we can make a life, we can, you know. Or, yeah, 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 look at me now. Yeah, it's a very different perspective depending on who you are and, and, and who's looking. Um, so yeah. Absolutely, it's built in. It's not unfamiliar at all. But uh, but it's all about then power, right? I mean, Emperor Claudius used a lot of freedmen to be his secretaries and to do a lot of administrative work for him. And the senators, of course, think this is terrible. The society is collapsing yet again. And, uh, and and so there's always this tension about that from our elite authors. But yeah, it's very much built in all the way back. So let's continue over refreshments, and thank you very much to Dr. Paul.